Hi all, I'm Giovanni Santamaria, Associate Professor at Department Chair of the School of Architecture and Design at the New York Institute of Technology. On behalf of our Dean, Maria Perbellini, I would like to thank and welcome our guest today, Professor Sir Peter Cook, and all our students, faculty, yeah. alumni, and friends attending this event. This is the final event of a series of six presentation and student-led interviews, part of the Master of Architecture uh, course, Special Study in Architecture, entitled Behind the Envelope at the School of Architecture and Design, taught by Professor uh, Tom Bereves. This is also part of our Spring 2022 lecture and event series titled Communities in the School of Architecture and Design New York Tech. Our school is honored to host Professor Sir Peter Cook today. In a live public broadcast, Sir Peter will present Peter Cook and Colin Fournier project, the Kunsthaus Graz, completed in 2003 in Graz, Austria. This will be followed by a student-led interview by MRC students, uh, Ethan Ross and by Bab Badadoria. Thanking again our guests and our faculty and staff who organized this event, I will now leave the stage to Professor Bereves for a brief introduction uh, of our guest. Enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for your welcome of uh, Sir Professor Peter Cook on behalf of Dean Prebellini. Uh, good afternoon, students, faculty, alumni, and public joining us today on YouTube Live. Uh, welcome to the sixth and final presentation inter interview event uh, within my graduate research seminar, Beyond the Envelope, here at New York Tech. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dean Perbellini and our Lectures and Events Committee Chair, Alessandro Mellis, and committee members for their support in integrating the presentation and interview events in my seminar into our tw Spring 2022 Lectures and Events series. Born out of the context of teaching and learning in 2020, the format of these events comprises a brief outline presentation by the architect of a recent important architectural project, focusing primarily on the design, production, construction, and life of one single building. Followed by a student-led interview led today by MRC students next to me, uh, Vaibhav Vadadoria and Ethan Ross. The project in focus today, uh, in addition to a more broad presentation uh, by Sir Peter, uh, is the Kunsthaus Grass completed in Graz, Austria in 2003, designed by Peter Cook and Colin Fournier. It's indeed an honor and a thrill to introduce uh, Peter Cook, currently founding director of CHAP, Cook Hafner Architecture Platform. Uh, I've been anticipating uh, this presentation into the event since last November when confirmed, uh, and really is one of a, a career highlight, I could say for me personally. Nicknamed the friendly alien, the Kunsthaus Graz uh, is an incongruent architectural jewel set in the Baroque and medieval urban context of Graz. It is a floating blue, shiny, smooth, three-dimensionally curvilinear bodily figure with pointy nozzles on its roof to provide filtered daylight to its upper gallery. In the parlance of the 1990s and early 2000s, the Kunsthaus is a blob. What makes this alien blob a friendly one rather than an adversarial conflict, conflictual or bitchy one to its host context? I believe this building to be a deeply contextual one in how it concurrently adheres to and coheres its urban situation, yet it also subverts, transforms and reinvents Graz. Tom, you are muted. I'm not sure how that happened. Wow. Um, so not dissimilar to architectural types, forms and institutions built in the 19th century, which had radically transformed European cities. This small museum has, has proven to be of great benefit to artists and curators and the city and citizens of Graz, which was European city of culture in 2003, the year this friendly alien had landed. The presence of the Kunsthaus has had the capacity to rebrand Graz. Not dissimilar to the Guggenheim's famous Bilbao effect, um, or how London's cultural scene was rebranded by the Tate Modern, for example. The Kunsthaus contributes to and continues the tradition of buildings which do not look like buildings of the past. They jar with the present and are rather gifts to the future. The Kunsthaus negotiates past and future tradition and innovation. To quote Peter in AD, um, in an article in AD, the architecture of the Kunsthaus represents a point in history where there is maximum design freedom. The architecture of the Kunsthaus is created by the radicality of its form and color, as well as by the mediating content communicated by its programmable external envelope, 
saturated with visual content and activated through embedded media technology. Resonating the Vienna School of the 60s and 70s and its radical new agendas and experimentation with new media of their time, this project reinforces the avant-garde myth of Graz through its alien form and material, as well as with its dynamic interactive skin. The art which fills the building is projected to public space, space with 900 circular neon lamps which function as pixels, programmed with images, text, and abstract film sequences via a central computer. Dynamic, playful, and stimulating, this truly transformative building makes people take notice, behave differently, and makes us reflect about our built environment in general. The architect of this transformative project, Professor Sir Peter Cook, is a registered architect and was a founder of Archigram, former director of the Institute for Contemporary Art in London, the ICA, and the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London. He was a pivotal figure within the global architectural world for over half a century. His ongoing contribution to architectural innovation was recognized by the conferral of an honorary doctorate in April 2010 by Lund University in Sweden. Peter's achievements with the radical experimental group Archigram have been the subject of numerous publications and public exhibitions, and the members of Archigram were recognized by the Royal Institute of British Architects in 2002, when the members of the group were awarded the RIBA's highest award, the Royal Gold Medal. In 2007, Peter was knighted by Queen Elizabeth for his services to architecture. Sir Peter is also a royal academician and a commandeur des l'ordre des arts et des lettres of the French Republic. Peter is currently a senior fellow of the Royal College of Art in London. His professorships include those of the Royal Academy, uh, University College London, and Hochschule für Bildung Kunst, uh, the Städelschule in Frankfurt, Main, Germany. Peter has, from the very beginning, made waves in architectural circles. However, it is since the construction of his art museum in Graz, Austria, the Kunsthaus Graz, uh, the focus of part of today's event, um, that his work has been brought to a wider public, a process continuing with the completion of the Vienna Business and Economics Universities, Departments of Law and Central Administration Buildings, and Bond University in Australia's Abidi and Architecture School. Peter has also built in Osaka, Nagoya, Berlin, Frankfurt, and Madrid. He is now the founding director of CHAP, Cook Hafner Architecture Platform, with offices in London, Oslo, and Belgrade. They're involved in projects in the Near East and Far East, as well as in Norway and the UK. Peter has recently competed, completed his second building for the Arts University in Bournemouth on the south coast of England. Join me, please, to welcome to New York Tech, Sir Professor Peter Cook. Thank you. No, I share, yeah? Yes, please. So actually, um, I will be talking about the Kunsthaus Graz, but, but really sort of um, clouded in, in the midst of a whole lot of other material, because I'm here uh, at this moment in Scandinavia, following up on a, 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 the, first, the largest exhibition of my own work that's ever been held in one place. And, and the work is in, in this case, entirely drawings. And the themes that I'm going to relate to, then I think pull the drawings towards the built work and perhaps the built work out back to the drawings again. So I will be talking about Kunsthaus Graz, but only as a, a, a little piece of the, the whole thing. I, I haven't realized it meant to concentrate so much on that building. Doesn't matter, I think. Uh, uh, you will get, you'll get what you get, but um, I think it'll tell you a lot about my design process because um, it, it is a very long period of time. I'm still in the vertical position and I'm still doing projects and buildings and I'm still certainly doing many drawings. And I'm here in, in Copenhagen, which is, very, which is very near where the art museum is uh, that's showing the work. And uh, I, as, as, as you said, I'm uh, working together with Scandinavian colleagues who I meet now immediately after this lecture. So here you see me very recently, just a few months ago, sitting in, in the garden in London where the sort of metal gazebo, which I constructed during the lockdown, is now already bearing fruit, so to speak. 
And I may, I'm working on a big drawing of a landscape, of a kind of landscape. Um, and actually, I seem to be not only wearing this jacket that I'm wearing now, but I'm also wearing, I think, the same shirt as Tom. If, if I'm not, if I'm not <laughs> mistaken. So over this long period, there are certain markers. Even back in '63, when I had only come out of the Architectural Association two or three years, and was working for a big building constructor called Taylor Woodrow, I was allowed. I was actually being paid to indulge in a project such as this, which has been recently revived as a drawing. It, it actually sits in a museum. It, the original sits in a museum in Frankfurt. But I then reworked the drawing and made it almost like a more emblemic poster-like thing. Uh, of course, the most notable project in my early days was the Plug-in City, done during my membership of this uh, group of people called Archigram. Those of us who are still alive are still friends. Uh, in fact, the three in London live very close to each other. And the project was made, I give a bit of background on this drawing because there are other drawings of the Plug-in City. And again, they, the, 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 the original sit in museums, but uh, this one was done after my first year of teaching at the AA. And I was 27 when I was hired. And uh, it was an extraordinary experience because there was 15 people who were either my age or older in the class. I was 27 at the time. And then my boss uh, had a nervous breakdown and I was landed effectively controlling the, 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 this very, um, shall I say, verbose and arrogant and big group of people, 85 AA fifth years who were about to graduate. And I was exhausted. I, I, you know, when I became effectively a, at that young age, an armchair psychologist helping people out of their corners and I was totally exhausted. And then at the end of the nine months of teaching, <laughs> all this drawing came out of my head. I didn't do any drawing in that period. And this was really a distillation of all the developing ideas about this project that were coming since the early drawings. And we shall see one or two of those. And I, I mentioned that in particular because I think then there, there's already a link between teaching and doing that, that I have been having to think, having to take my brain through 85 other people's work and discuss and argue and clean things up and, and coax people and stuff. And somehow I've never had to do that as intensively since, but it probably was interesting in that, that meanwhile I was itching but too exhausted to, to, to continue with the project. And of course, I think that the the drawing that emanated at the end of that is, is infinitely more interesting <laughs> to me anyhow, and certainly more sophisticated than the drawing that came before. Uh, then <laughs> one moved on to a number of projects that were to do with movable architecture, throwaway architecture, the replacement of, of city events by a kind of traveling circus that could make your local village into a city. And this manifests itself sometimes in almost cartoon-like drawings. This one is really um, very much a, a sort of graphic description of things going on. And that became a, a, a clue for a lot of the work because a lot of the work was to do with process, was to do with disintegration, was to do with movement, was to do with things changing their shape. And then sometimes there were drawings, and this is, I think, a very one-off almost, uh, which, is, which is a collage. I didn't do, I still don't do very many collages, but I was trying to capture the, the condition of, of sort of weightlessness. I, I, I was never into drugs and I was never into surfboarding, but 
I, this sort of sense of floating that you sometimes get in a dream. I was trying to convey that and say this would be the ultimate um, environmental experience. And, and, and I used the collage to try and say that. And certainly in the, in the, in the current exhibition, though actually I'm using a reproduction, it's a very, the reproduced version, it's very large and very powerful and, and in a way rather strange. And I, I do enjoy strangeness. I think that's going to come up again and again. And this prob probably um, underlies something that one very, very rarely talks about vis-a-vis -vis the Kunsthaus, which is that we, Colin Fournier, who's the equal designer with me, I should say, uh, he, he and I all, always had as a sort of unspoken uh, criterion that it would certainly wake up Graz. It would certainly be a strange object that, it, that in one way it knits into the scale of Graz, but at the other end it, it sort of stops you short. Uh, a very key project was this, which is a part of a series called The Urban Mark. And I came back a little while down the road, back to the proposition that the uh, plug-in city had made, which was to use some kind of megastructure. And in this case, to then not only replace the parts with similar parts, but to actually, uh, to actually encourage its disintegration, its metamorphosis from this very mechanized things with identifiable elements into something else, which we will see in a moment. And sometimes my drawings have included pieces of, of a sort of, dare I say, equipment or apparatus or components, which probably go further than the strangeness of grants. Here is something which is quite frankly a, a, a sort of technical insertion into the building, but instead of it being uh, housed in sort of aluminum tubes and pipes and, and steel sort of coffers and so on. It's, it's this nasty, naughty, gnarling animal with, with vague air supply and heat and, and God knows what, orange juice perhaps coming out of it. And then there was the exploration of, of the garden, the interaction of vegetation. Now, for the last 32 years, I've lived in an apartment in, in a suburb of London, which has a very large garden. <coughs> and also has old trees at the back of the garden into a common uh, wooded area. And it's very lucky in, in that, so centrally to, to have that. And many of the drawings that I do, I'm looking out at the garden looking through trees, even in the front where I draw as well. Uh, I look onto trees. I have to say that in our new office, we look out onto a railway station. So that's a little bit different to see what effect that might have. But um, I, I am uh, surrounded by trees. I'm very, I'm not a gardener per se. My wife does the gardening, but I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in the idea of vegetation extending the vocabulary of architecture. But then sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I do something which is so deliberately uh, anti-natural that um, I, I, I strain to enjoy its artificiality. On one hand, I enjoy vegetation. On the other hand, I, I, I'm, I'm not a sort of what I call a wood, brown rice, sandals, natural, I, I'm a city person too. I don't really enjoy the countryside very much. And, and this was a, a project done very much to, to, to assert it's the, 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 the delight of the artificial and the shiny. On the other hand, I'm interested in delving into the uh, ambiguity between natural conditions and, and the constructed so that this composite drawing which I did in, in, in Norway many sort of seven years ago or more um, during Christmas holiday. And I did it in little components. I did it in little sort of 
uh, foolscap size sheets that I drew on and then joined them together when I got back in London and then worked over the, the print. And you will see the naughty sort of conical hats on the left, <coughs> which are very much saying these are naughty man-made things. And then you will occasionally see stripy glass, clearly some architectural element. But then there are others where it's deliberately ambiguous as to whether they're tectonic or whether they're vegetational, whether there are patterns of drift or possible patterns of change. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, 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 in almost forcing myself to contend the perimeters and characteristics of the natural, the possibly natural, the possibly inserted, or the possibly constructed. And this issue of metamorphosis crops up in a lot of early work. Some, some this is very mechanical, of course, and this urban mark series where you see the structure, the developed structure, the filled structure, and then it gradually disintegrating bit by bit by bit. And another metamorphic story uh, is to do with Berlin, particularly a, a city which I've spent a lot of time in. I, I've uh, built a building there. I've held several exhibitions there. Uh, I've spent a lot of time lecturing many friends there, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a city which fascinates. And this was done at the period right at the end of the separated city, just before it became uh, a unified city, it was still West Berlin. And it's to do with the, a, a very important street in West Berlin, which is called the Kapustendam. It's a beautiful, elegant street, which then at the end of it just goes, oh, mm. it's on the limp. It, 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 it's heroic at one end and nothing at the other end. The site is adjoining that limp end and fills it in with <coughs> what I think of as a Western idea. It, it, it imposes a kind of American grid on this little site. Uh, it's a spooky site with a lake and some very sort of strange old villas and it's very spooky and railway yards and it's a funny area. And I reinforce that, I, I sort of romantically associate that with the, the Berlin of the, uh, the pre-Second World War. And on this forgotten piece of land, I superimpose this, this American grid with an American architecture taken not from the East Coast, but taken from the Wild West. I borrow cacti and such things, and the cacti metamorphose onto the building. The building become more and more cacti like so the the, the term way out west is a sort of du entendre it's a the way out of the west of Berlin and it's the west of the west that it's looking at it's a it's a it's a strange project and yet the metamorphosis of the building it starts as you see on the left hand section very straightforwardly a series of high rise medium and high rises and then they become infiltrated by parasites of various kinds. Now, again, this is at the height of a period of teaching when a lot of lot was being talked about in the A at that time about parasites. And in the same way that the airship version of Instant City, people were talking about airships. Often there's a conversation going on in, 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 in the school and I pick up on my own take of it. I can't just sort of sit in the seminar and discuss it, uh, an issue. I'd like to go away and draw it. And you'll see this again in a project that I did at Rice. Uh, this is another metamorphic project where I take the proposition of a house, a triangular, a sheltered triangular area with a series of armatures in it. And the vegetation starts progressively to creep onto the armatures. And it creeps onto them more and more and more. And then there are various hybrids of sort of hi-fi mixed with vegetation, seats and beds. Even the kitchen becomes surrounded by it. And then, and then the roof over it, the yellow territory is inhabited on the roof with vines that gradually increase and increase and become 
spookier and then <laughs> the drawings absorb certain sort of key buzzwords such which, which are romantic slow weave and fold and glade and and then in the later stage it, 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 I think parts that are friendly and parts that are constantly weaving and then the, the, the final one gets so loony that I, I, I stop the process. I say, it can't, it can't go any further. But it, it spawns a, a, a sub-project which is called Veg Village, <coughs> which effectively takes a series of such houses in different shapes. And then in the progression of three, as you move across, you see how that also suppurates and mel molds and the, and the hydroponic vegetation thing leans into the house etc etc and so this business the vegetation is, is definitely a theme you there are there are certain beautiful houses particularly in in, in england which uh, take natural vegetation and then impose upon sort of man's interference or control or, or sculpting if you like uh this one is uh, Garden by Gertrude Jekyll on, on, next to a, a Latian's uh, building, Castle Drogo, which is a more, more sort of harsh formalism. And here in, in Schwetzingen in Germany, I think I'm, I'm, fasc I'm fascinated by the uh, similarity to, to almost urban organization. If you look at these series of stri stripes, different types, different interpretations of vegetation, it is man interfering uh and and making of it actually a complete uh you know there are nine or ten strands running around and and, and they are different uh, ways of attempting to control nature which of course you don't completely or here in Svetzing, um, the, the business of making arcading and that influenced a lot of the work that i did Sometimes, though, even the, the proposal can be controlled in its own way, so that this is really a, a, a kind of a portmanteau of several different interferences, including formal architecture, as you see in the <coughs> left hand side. And as I traveled more and more, particularly around Europe and Japan, uh, I start to enjoy some of the tricks of, of, of organized vegetation and from Japan the insertion of special events from which you look from one position to the next and are then seduced into moving towards it and then another thing is revealed rather like the, the way the, J the Japanese use tea houses and little insertions and special trees and Piles. I think there's a, a big relationship between that knowingness and, and the, the, the kinds of games that were played by the romantic uh, English gardeners. I find that uh, I'm fascinated both by Japanese and English means of, of making a theatre of the process of moving through space. And I often refer, when talking about architecture, to the idea of theatre. And sometimes then I weave it into a building. And that's this drawing you see is, is later than the, the, the one I was just showing here, that one that I described earlier with the drift. And this one is much more, and is more recent, is a sort of confrontation of a harsh landscape, a hard, relentless rock rocks against some architecture and you can see it's a piece of inserted village as it were into the rocks of it but then the, the forest i call it um a hard landscape friendly forest so each forest has little buildings that just live at the edges of the forest the forest is not the unknown hostile thing that sometimes it's painted as but in fact is a friendly element. This is on the other hand, a harsh 
landscape with the buildings inserted, sort of clinging on for dear life to the precipice of the, of the, of the rock. And sometimes, uh, with colleagues, sometimes I, I make drawings of vegetation inserted into cities. Uh, or a tower in which ve the vegetational um, part of the vocabulary is but one. <coughs> this is very much this kind of almost like a bedroom quilt of, of, of architecture creeping up this tower. <coughs> well, this, which is a recent drawing, the proposition that instead of enlarging existing villages, you you keep the forest, but then you have a, a, a concentration of building. And I'm fascinated by hedges. This is one that I saw many years ago, uh, actually standing next to a green and green house in Pasadena. And, I, and, and my students, I'd already seen the house several times. My students were all photographing the Pasadena house on the right hand side. By this time, I was much more fascinated by the hedge. I thought, my God, I wonder if that hedge could be a house. And sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite selfish about things that I see. Uh, I don't want to be told that it isn't a house. I want to believe that it is a house, that it is useful to me as a as a potential house. So I'm selfish about the things that I see. Uh, and I'm fascinated by this. I, I was there again the other day and I couldn't find it. I have a horrible feeling it's been taken away. And, but it generated this project, which was the notion of inhabiting a hedge with the house behind. The hedge, the part that, where the hedge is inhabited is just as important as the house behind. And there are then a whole series of projects which are to do with the alternative city. Now, when I was a student at the AA, there was a kind of interesting thing that I, I noticed has tended to lapse over the years, which was that when you did a building, it was a prototype. Even if it was a sort of almost one-off building, it could still be a prototype for the way in which things should be done. You did a you did a, a, a you did something on a single plot and you said now the next plot down the street could be more of that and more of that <coughs> rather like i show the the veg house was a one-off and then i show it with other veg houses as a proposition and um so in my mind, there's no, and I still retain something of that attitude so that in a way there's no dividing line between a project per se and the suggestion. And if you, if you make projects such as that, you are suggesting that a city might have many such projects or, or the qualities of that project could extend beyond the, the brief of that particular element. And um, this is this is an exercise in weaving, weaving different sort of geometricized components, strips of, of path with vegetation, formal vegetation, water, rockery, all sorts of things. Again, it's kind of not a collage, but almost um, conceptually a collage. And then um, as, as a visiting professor at, at Rice one year, where I came for a few weeks, went away and then came back again for another few weeks, um, in a series of seminar, morning seminars, we were discussing Houston and the students were interested to know what I thought about Houston. I said, when I come back in six weeks time, I will have drawn what I think about. I'm not gonna talk it, I'm gonna draw it. <clears throat> what I was fascinated was the notion of extending the car domination of Houston by having a cont controlled car system, which sort of predates what we're now doing with, with, with driverless cars, but just that you'd, you'd have a gridded system in this extension of Houston. And the fact that it's all under, under the trees, because from where I was staying, you would look from the seventh floor and you just saw trees. 
but you knew as soon as you got down to ground level, it actually continuous buildings under those trees. And that really fascinated me. And this is a project then concerned with organization and tree cover as much as this is to do with a certain kind of architecture. This is a project that actually in, in the middle drawing does relate very, very much to, to grants. The, the grants project uh, had, had just been built. And this was a, a project shared with some of my colleagues in Madrid for, and, we, and there was a mayor of a small town on the edge of Madrid who wanted to expand the town and we got this job to do a master plan. And I concentrated upon what I call the Acropolis part of the master plan, which suggests a number of buildings on legs. Uh, the red thing is the golf club because the whole suburb is based around the importance of the, the golf club. And certain ideas about um, the town person or the, the tradition of the flaneur, the person who, who likes sort of showing off in the town or the, or, the, or, the, or the skateboarder or the person who likes to hang out and flirt with the girls or whoever. There's an old, certain old towns, you get the, the people sort of hanging around the middle of the town in a lazy kind of way. And I was trying to make a, a, a world of, of kiosks and little small scale marketing things, probably a rather romantic idea to admit, that would sit underneath the proper buildings, the buildings, the main buildings being up on legs, and this second world underneath. And then on top of the buildings, a sport territory. So the tennis courts and the running tracks and so are on the top of the buildings, the general purpose living and offices and so on in the middle. And then this much more serendipitous thing going on underneath it. <clears throat> and there've been other urban projects where, as, as a professor in Frankfurt, I was interested in, 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 in the knitting of Frankfurt and Offenbach together with, a, with a, some streets of villas, but instead of the sort of uh, 19th century villa, villa the idea of uh, virtually a sort of Maison Domino writ large, which would then allow different architects or different groups of people to make their own mm. architecture on locked onto this. Uh, there's also sort of backyard industry and some other conversations going on. And yesterday, in fact, this morning, I was in Gothenburg which I find fascinating as, as, as a city that sets up a very intriguing device in the center of the city. It is a, <clears throat> it has some canal, a canal system which was related to the fortification system of the old city. And it goes sort of zigzag around the middle. And the interesting thing that these guys did is about the turn of the uh, 19th to the 20th century, they, put a series of largish buildings along the side of the canal. What's really interesting is that whenever you turn, there's some kind of tower. Now you can see even in these pictures, we see already a yellow tower, a red tower, a rounded black tower, another pointed tower, and a green tower. So that these towers are like little markers. And I am fascinated by that because I think some modernist architecture sort of lost all that, that, you, that a lot of stuff looks the same. And I'm a romantic, I have to admit that I'm not really not a classicist. I'm, 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 I'm intrigued by the theater of moving around Gothenburg. Not only do you get the water changing direction, but you get these markers. You look down, there's the red one, move towards it. Ah, now there's the green one, you move towards that. <clears throat> and one has done a series of funny projects. Um, probably this top left one, very Scandinavian. And then some of the waterside projects have got <clears throat> more crazy. And this is a drawing <clears throat> which has just grown from the middle. I just started it and, and made myself a program that it would indeed become a series of islands. 
but I didn't quite know what they would be. I just knitted the drawing. It's really like a, a sort of elaborate scribble. And I find that the elaborate scribbles sometimes are very useful and can be applied to built buildings or proposedly built buildings. And I'm interested in continuity and metamorphosis of form so that here is a, a, a city hall, you can see it's a city hall with the, the tower and the big sort of secretariat and then the secretariat starts to disintegrate and it turns it becomes even weirder and then right and right at the end of the top right hand side of the room is a sort of marketplace so that the activity has gone from the heroic tower at one end, the solid building, the, the metamorphosis of the solid building, and then there's just a guy with a trestle table selling boot shoelaces at the very far end, and they're all part of a continuum. But sometimes, with the help of my younger colleagues, we're interested in, in the disintegrative form that this, in this project was a, a, a sequence of buildings that were basically on a, a similar organisation, but we were each of these museums, as they were meant to be, each of them took on a different take according to the, the subject of the museum, whether it was a sort of archaeological museum in one case or a children's museum in another case. <coughs> It's a good part of that. Now, another theme that has interested me fairly recently uh, uh, was one based upon really observing my friends, even a lot of people are not my friends, that in, in architectural circles, in, certainly in London, and I, I, I know in, in many other places too, even the most extremely tiresome, Marxist or purist or rationalist or boring person in general, or even the jolly people and the nice people and the fruity people, you say to them Tuscany and they go, ah. they all say, oh, Tuscany, yes, white wine, yes, sunny hills. Oh. And then half of them say, I'm, I'm actually off there next week now, now that we're able to fly again. And uh, if they don't go to Greece, that is. And I, I'm sort of, I am very cynical about it. You know, I, oh, bloody hell. Yes, of course, they go to Tuscany. Yeah, God, here we go. You know, it's rather like being a wine snob in a way. And so I say, right, let's, if you can't beat them, join them. I'll do a Tuscan hilltop town. How, how about that? And um, then I take it further. And I say, yeah, we could do a Tuscan hilltop town. There's the Campanini, there's the valley below, there are Tuscan farmhouses, there's a cafe on the right. And there's a bit of peacock interpretation of what the Tuscan hilltop might be like. And even then I went further and started to draw the plan. I enjoyed drawing plans of, of cities. Nobody's commissioned me to do a city, but, but here it has, <coughs> it's a, a deliberate mixture as you might by now expect of, 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 you know, some commonplace elements there on towards the right of it is, is, um, is a covered market. And in front of it is sort of town square and a town hall. And there's a connect company, of course, and then there's some narrow streets and some narrow streets and some enclosed courtyards, etc., etc. <laughs> well, yes, except there's also some very weird stuff as well creeping out of it the center of this there's the company in the front but there's the center this the center is a kind of mound which is maybe a hotel with the parts of the hotel sprouting out of the, the mound whereas a very ordinary deliberately ordinary cupboard market is down on the bottom left there and it is a walled town but with inhabited walls of course very much more recently, I've been interested extending towards looking again at some of the um, generic elements, such as the capsules, the platforms, the drapes, and I mean, came interested in veiling, not just letting the thing be exposed, but but and also I think it's to do with 
<coughs> genuinely being interested in add-ons, awnings. I've always felt that the, the way of analyzing a city by way of a simple figure ground is to course because it only it forces you into a into a binary solution. Either the building's there or it's not there. Whereas if you think of my 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 own town plan I've just shown you, it's also it's, there are, there's the presence of the object, but then there's the presence of the nature of the object. There are different categories and different and and in fact this drawing takes it further where it says you know. All that you see isn't necessarily extant. Some of it is veiled, some of it is hanging, some of it is loose, some of it is tight. And very recently, this is a very new drawing. I go down into a, a town, into a narrow street, which is deliberately sinister. There's a jolly optimistic architecture somewhere there, sort of the rainbow's end, as it were. But before that, there's a spooky territory. And I realized I made a slide of the unfinished drawing. The drawing is the finalized drawing. There's less white in it. It's actually much, much more spooky. And um, it is deliberately, people are disappearing down. Holes. It's a little bit back to the, the sort of goodbye to Berlin aspect of Berlin that I showed before. Another project which is to some extent related to some of the work that we're doing in the office is a sunshine village location I'm not allowed to say and a series of villas creeping up a steep hill and then I find that I'm using this, this almost decorative device which didn't in my mind start off as looking as decorative as it looks now, which is the sun that, that you have, again, control bales. These are actually sun-shaded areas that, that sit in front of these hard buildings that are cut almost scissor-like, scissor-like insertions. And a very recent drawing, literally two weeks ago, um, which is of three cities really dealing with formalism and, and, and the interference of vegetation. So the left-hand city, quite frankly, is curved. The right-hand city is more Gothic. And the foreground city is a kind of take on an industrial modernist city. <clears throat> and uh, there are various experiments going on, projects. And, and here we get into territory that I can't, I'm not allowed to. Uh, disclose what this is a study for, but it's a project going on at the moment in, 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 in the studio. And here's another uh, take on the city where one proposes that the city after all might be a room, a giantly scaled room so that you have a, the actual city is enclosed and has sort of upper layers hanging, uh, supported by these pylons. And it's the drawing is called the city as a room. <clears throat> I've been fascinated by towers, particularly iconic ones. This is a nice little one in Brighton and a probably better known one in Darmstadt. <clears throat> and right back to the fifth, uh, sorry, the sixties, uh, that same drawing with the red background that I showed, here's the model of the same project where the proposition is that the, the Tower is really an armature. Think of it like a hat stand where you hang your hat and coats on, on that, that you have this armature, this stand, and then you hang the architecture on it. <clears throat> Much later was one that we did, uh, which was to demonstrate the growth of algae, and the use of algae, and the right-hand one is the development of that same project. And then in Oslo, in <coughs> the region, <coughs> I mean, now, uh, again, as uh, when working as a guest professor, I was interested in the idea of the lantern, this thing which at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, these wonderful lanterns that appear in streets, just usually above shop window height, and using the cheap electricity that they have, and they glow in the dark, many dark nights. 
The other thing is the color of, of this, which is picking up on, on uh, the color palette that was loved by the Norwegian functionalist architects, but was actually a quotation of the, the Heath, Heath colors that you get up on the table land, the, the, the behind Oslo towards the north, the same colors that you see growing amongst the rocks are the colors that are used in that palette. And of course, the key thing is the nighttime, the lanterns, which start at a sort of small scale lantern scale near the ground, become window scale lanterns, become room scale lanterns, become apartment scale lanterns, and finally become the lantern at the whole top of the building. And then as a, as a professor in Frankfurt, I thought my, um, which is an art academy, I thought all my art, artist friends in Frankfurt, there are lots of museums being made for them, but nowhere being made for them to have studios. Uh, in another city, and I'm flip-flopping around time-wise, you'll have to forgive that, but I, I, I'm showing you something I did two weeks ago, and I'm showing you something which I did in 1986 now. Because in a way, some of the ideas circulate round and round and round. As in Brisbane, again, as a, a visiting uh, professor just for a month or two, and I was fascinated by the old uh, Brisbane metal houses that the British took down to Australia uh, that were resistant to all the, the, the rather unpleasant animals that you get there and, and allowed a lot of cross ventilation through verandas. And I said, why can't we make a high rise that does the same thing? These you have seen. And then in Paris, uh, a project where one places a series of apartments that incidentally rotate um, if you wish them to, so that you can avoid the noisy dog next door or the growing couple next door, or you can move it towards uh, a different plantation in the autumn or whatever. You, you have a variety, you just simply move the plate of the house. And at the back of it is a growing, vertically growing sort of English garden with allotments in it and many other projects for, for towers. Uh, one that is reflecting my <clears throat> attraction to the culture and architecture of Brazil, which I had right back as, as, a, as a very young student. I was fascinated by Roberto Verli Marx and Carmen Miranda and all of that. And then was lucky to have been lucky enough to visit Brazil a few times and uh, could not resist at some point in making a statement via a, a, a design for a tower. More Brazilian than the Brazilians, I think. Or other towers which are housing, but interested in the idea of only inhabiting a very small amount of the ground. <coughs> My wife comes from Tel Aviv, and so I've visited that city many times and take a sort of non-Jew outsider's view of it, which is particularly towards the left-hand tower, which is to be placed in the middle of that circle. In fact, um, uh, Eric Mendelssohn, when he, when he did the original proposal for that and then left the local guys to develop it, he always wanted there to be three towers in the middle. And for decades, it's been left without, now they're actually building some towers, not my one, I have to say. My one is really to reflect what I see as the entrepreneurial nature of Tel Aviv. And so it's a series of, of, of ac entrepreneurial activities, car showroom, hotel, dentist offices, uh, apartments, more offices of a different kind, etc. And each of those categories is placed one on top of the other, like a kebab if you like, but instead of, as happens now very often, where you say have a hotel and then it's apartments and then it's something else, <clears throat> and the architect tries to make it all look similar as a single tower, I say, no, each of those has its own building, so to speak. It's just you put the buildings one on top of the other. And <clears throat> the tower 
theme then even extends back onto the West project. More recently, with the, the beginning of my activities with the, with the, the, the current office, we were involved in a project for Shenzhen, which was a sort of exhibition tower. But in this case, I'm also demonstrating, we didn't win the competition by the way, but we were in the last group, um, where I'm wrapping the structure, inserting very special kinds of capsules, and then having a series of other sort of decoy elements onto each of the towers. <clears throat> I'm interested in this issue of the armature then, that I've already mentioned in connection with the towers. I, think, I, I love piers, and I think it's because I come from and have lived in the seaside several times. And the seaside pier is a wonder, as, 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 as Peter Rader Bannum would always cite Santa Monica Pier as the prototype megastructure. But here I'm almost also talking about another kind of pier, which is just something which is this structure that's set out into the unknown, rather like those towers poke upwards, these poke into the sea, and then you can wrap them with this and this and this and this. And scavening is a particular favorite of mine. <clears throat> and so I've always been interested in armatures, even early days with the, the instant village where the hovercraft will move, stop, hydronically extend, inflate, form a cover, and there you have your, your sort of circus tents, so to speak, of the village, and then it can collapse and move on. And armatures <clears throat> were certainly very much involved in the plug-in city. And some of those vegetational structures that I showed earlier, when we see them in plan, they're actually consisting of a series of overlaid and interlaced armatures. Well, the idea of the, the pier that can land, and form a, an urban structure, the land pier. <clears throat> More recently, I've been interested in, in looking at what some of my colleagues at the Bartlett have done in terms of movable structures and growable, growable architecture, actually using, using the kind of organic growth, aggressive organic growth. And I, I lay the, the skin made of this condition onto a kind of skeletal thing so that as you move towards the edge of the building, it becomes more Plant. The whole thing isn't wobbling around wildly, but it is it is it has the potential to sort of pulsate and droop love, rather like your mouth when it's full of soup, it will change change shape. And that is an attempt at the uh, suggesting the exterior of that same building. <clears throat> and of course, in in the exhibition I have right now, there are also some oddball projects that don't really come into the group the category of a group or a particular direction. It's sort of strange, you know, what happens when you combine lots of different strange materials? What happens when you take the solar house, which we worked on quite a lot of the time for projects, and uh, combine it as a whole city of solar houses? What happens if you analyze a piece of uh, orchestral music and ex extrapolate it as built form, because I'm always very fascinated by the similarity between urban design and symphonic structure of music. <coughs> Not that I'm a musician particularly, I have a son who is, but uh, that's far away. And um, then there's some drawings which are really just sort of a little one-off propositions, a house in the hedges looking out on the on the sea seabed, or a small pavilion in the middle of a town, or just loony kinds of let's see what happens if drawings, which are a big exhibition such as the one I have right now, is able to group together and, and pose in contradistinction to the more 
organized sets of projects. They're, they're scribbles, really, but you never know quite what's going to come out of the scribble. <coughs> well, this project, which is really just a flat collection of almost facade propositions, a tree facade, a skin facade, a glass facade, a drifting, a floating, a hanging. Uh, slightly Schlemmer-like even, I suspect. And, and, and to the stuff. There was once an exercise I did, I, I had made a drawing for AD magazine on the subject of the comfortable vegetated club, the Comfo Veg Club. And then a little while later uh, at SIOC, they asked me to do an exhibition and I did a version of the comfortable vegetated club. It's not really vegetation, it's, it's cloth and rubber, but it's, it was on the same theme. And uh, it was very comfortable. In fact, it was so comfortable that I'm assured that over the two months that it was there, very, very naughty things went on in the degree of comfort that I'd offered them. And then I took the same thing, and none, something which I've not had the chance to do very often, which is to, to construct something, take the construction as far as it went, and then reinvent the Comfort Veg Club around it. So it's kind of rollover with the, with the physically made object in the middle of the rollover. And we come finally to the Kunsthaus Graz. One of the things I think that's, that is, you know, I, I, I mentioned that one was interested in, in, in shock and contrast, if you like. But in fact, in terms of scale, the building beds itself, I think, very comfortably into the scale of grants. The other thing is in terms of its eccentricity as architecture. I have to say that not only did I, did I know the site quite well, because by this time, I'd been taking groups of students uh, by now from the Bartlett to Graz and to Vienna. And I would always do two days in Graz and maybe three or four days in Vienna because there's a lot of very interesting uh, 20th century architecture in, in Graz. Uh, and, and, you know, most of the people who did them are or were or have been, if they arrived, the friends of mine, I, I, I was very much uh, the first time I went there was at the request of Gunter Domenic, who himself has done some very intriguing and, and original work, uh, as spooky as anything that I've done. And then Volker Ginka, his protege, and uh, various other people of what is historically called the Grazer Schuler. I would say that Graz has at least sort of six or eight really, really highly inventive architects roughly of my generation, some of them a bit younger. And it had a, a great, but, but even if you go into history, you find it's a very intriguing, it's a sort of patchwork town. It's not big enough to ever have large heroic runs of anything. And it clings on to a hill with a, a rather stupid looking castle that looks like a cuckoo clock sitting on the top of the hill. And in fact, if you look at the nozzles there, all the nozzles are facing try and catch a bit of the sun. They're not actually big enough, but be that as it may. And then one of them is not lining up at all. It's turned. You can see it's the one right, right down there. It is pointing at the castle. And when you go in the building, you know, whatever's been going on in the exhibitions, so suddenly you look out and it's pointing at the cuckoo clock on the hill. I mean, the, which of course the whole of Grants was aware of the, this, this Castle on the hill. And you say, uh -huh, there you are. So that, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a nod. It's more than a nod. It's a kind of wave at this other building that's sitting on the hill there. And then the needle, as we call it, this horizontal bar here, was something which originally in the, in the competition project, Colin and I wanted to put the restaurant in it, right? Seems a good idea. It's up, up high. It looks over the river, looks over the valley, has fantastic views, etc. Cetera, et cetera. 
<clears throat> and then the fire, you know, once we won the competition, the fire people got hold of us and said, you know, if you're going to put the restaurant up there, you've got to have extra fire stairs, you've got to have this, you've got to have that. The nightmare. So we said, okay, don't, oh, okay, okay, we'll put the restaurant on the ground floor. And then the city said, well, then you don't need this thing, do you? And we, like a couple of queens almost said, oh, no, 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 we've got to keep it, got to keep it. It's, 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 it's part of the composition, and actually it is a major part of the composition. You take it away and the whole thing goes front back. You put the needle in it, whole scan, and it, it aligns the line of the river which is running below it. So it's, and, and this raising the issue of composition, I feel is almost a kind of, uh, it's almost a kind of throwback. Thing. I, you never hear people talk about composition in architecture very much. They do this, they do that, but to compose something, to say, this goes wrong, well, if it's on that, but it must go there, you know, and or to take something else and then say, that composes well if it goes there. Ah, oh, got it. Um, I think it's still extremely valid. Anyhow, but we were allowed to keep it. <clears throat> and it sits there above the bulbous part. The other thing is that when uh, it, the building was done very quickly, really, um, and it was done in two years, and uh, it came in about 3% over budget. And it came in two and a half months late. Now, for an art building, nearly every museum that anybody ever does is really boring months. They can't, they always come in way over budget. And they always come, and they're always done rather late. Ours, by comparison, was almost on time and almost on budget. But it was also a weird building. And and I think because we were we, I think between us and our various colleagues and supporters and investigators if you like we were we were quite uh, ingenious we we dig out odd sort of local crafts people who could do special things we found some cheap steel in a goods yard in near near um, in, in, in east of europe we were geographically positioned close to other places where people could come on little cars from poorer countries than austria and, and 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 we could keep the budget down by a lot of a lot of sniffing around and finding people and doing things in a slightly unorthodox way. And we had a brilliant engineer, really, the, the who I'm, I'm again currently in the last uh, year or so have been working with quite closely, of course, called Klaus Bollinger of the company Bollinger and Grumman, who have done all the <coughs> all the structural work. For Carl Himmelbrand for the last few years, and also did did the um, uh, the building by Sana in Lausanne. They're really wonderful engineers, and Klaus on this building really was the third beetle. I mean, he he and Colin and I really between us we made this thing happen. And um, it it's in very good. The last time I was there, which is two years ago. They clean, they clean it up, they replace the lamps very regularly, they uh, fill in the cracks in the floor. They, they like it. I mean, it, it, when, when it was first done, the local newspaper had a poll and 70% of the burgers of Graz hated it and 30% liked it. When it was finished, it was complete reverse statistics. 70% of the burgers liked it, 30% didn't like it still. And it has become a sort of icon in the way that, uh, you know, there are chocolate bars. There's, we even have a toaster, a toast rack at home, which is in the form of the building, T-shirts, posters, uh, blocks with digital pictures of the thing. It's become a sort of toy of the town. But I think it it's, it's also, um, because it's act, I, when I saw the, I don't know, there were 130 or something entries to the competition, <clears throat> most of the other competitors were much more fussy. It was a period of fussy, 
fussy uh, architecture. And this is basically a very simple proposition that you have this rectangular site which has a piece that's bitten out of the corner of it because you have to keep some old buildings. You had to keep the front building. Maybe we see it just on the left of the picture there. We had to keep the facade of that front building, which was cast iron because it was part of the heritage. The joke was that it had actually been made in Sheffield, England and shipped down to Graz. So I say fingers to heritage, you know, heritage is whatever you want to make it. There was some loony British down there in the 19th century and some more loony British down there at the tail end of the 20th century. Uh, so what? Uh, what the heritage? And um, there's an issue here, which is I've always a long time had this dream to make a building which didn't really have windows, but had degrees of percolation of light solid to uh, translucent to transparent and back. And they allowed us to do a little bit of it in grants. And then a couple of places where we started playing with this. Sorry. Uh, and then they, they, then they got worried, the city got worried that we were wasting money again, you know, and they said, no, no, stop pissing about, get on with it. Uh, and so, but there is a little, hint of another building there that I would love to do and can't, but I've not done that many buildings, but whenever I get one, uh, there, you, you find that there are certain limits beyond which the, <coughs> <coughs> the client won't need to go. Seems to have stuck. Ah, and this is a, a, a very expensive photographer from Donna's took this photograph. And it's, it's wonderful to see the lights throw these lights, which are constantly moving. They see the naughty nozzle, right? There it is, right in the middle of the picture. Uh, there's the naughty nozzle pointing to the castle. There's the, the, the needle coming now at a slightly different angle from the building because it's lining up with the river. And this notion of, of this kaleidoscopic thing, as are the, uh, the lights of the the vehicles that have moved past in the night. And you can see that actually scale-wise, it's uh, there's quite a large hotel building at the end there, which is not much higher than our building. It does sit like a sort of friendly dog in a, in a basket, I always say. And then manifesting something that you've been talking about in a project is, is a tricky one. Here is another piece of the surrounding of Madrid uh, not Pinto anymore, but, but Vallecas, uh, where we actually got a, a commission. Um, and the proposition was uh, taking from that Pinto project, the building on legs, the sports on the top, and the kiosks threaded underneath. What we hadn't bargained for was that, that having got the job, Spain ran out of money and the building was sitting half finished or half up, up to the third floor anyhow for about two years because it just went bankrupt. And then they found a builder who could complete the building, but the city didn't want any fun and games on the roof. They didn't like that idea. Nobody could be found to operate any kiosks, but the building is there. And, you know, there are a hundred families, there are a hundred cars underneath. Um, whether more recently the kiosks have started to be made, I'm not sure, but it, it is not as blue. It's lost the wonderful shutters that's, that we had. It's lost the sports, it's lost the kiosks. So it raises the issue, if Graz was, I, I always say, about, 92% what we wanted. There were certain things that we could have, we would have liked to have taken further, but it's about 90% 90, 90 there. Maybe even some bits are better than in the drawings. Certainly the engineering. Uh, here, you know, the substance is there, the stairs are there, the car park's there, the toilets work, blah, blah, blah. But to me, it's only half half the thing, it, the, those special, it raises the issue to what, what is essential to a project. 
<clears throat> is it the organization? Is it the carcass? Is, is it the image? If there's such a thing to be detached? Or is it the total package, as it were? Uh, here, again, building that is certainly four fifths of, of when we won the competition, it was, it, this has happened twice that we've won a competition and, and then the, the clients have said, look, you've got to knock 20% off the cost. Otherwise we will give the building to the second prize winner. That clears the mind wonderfully. You said, my God, I better do something then. In this case, we simply took a bail. We took out the workshop and, and one of the bays said, okay, you can put the workshop in a hut, which you find the money for later. And we, we cut, we managed to cut within the 20%. And it's, it's a building on the street. Now, of course, it is a school of architecture. And <clears throat> Gavin, who I was working with on it, he had taught quite a lot and attended three different architecture schools from, from Brighton, the Bartlett and Harvard. I had taught in three main schools, but also visited many, many others. And so when we were design, designing a school of architecture, it's like doing, doing a building for your day job. You know, it, it really was a succession of anecdotes, really. So, yeah, you know the room in Harvard, Harvard, you know that room at UCLA where you have a corridor above and you can look at the crypt. Huh? You know that funny basement at the bottom? Uh, you know that, etc., etc., etc. Was was sort of anecdotes of, of of tricks of the trade, and it okay, it knits them together in the sense on a very simple system of of a, of a east west corridor that slightly climbs up the hill, and the studios are on the south side, which of course in Australia is the cool side, and the small rooms with the variegated windows, which we see going down the side that one simply takes a whole series of different funny little local necessities and lets the facade almost sort of hang out as a result of that. Whereas the south side is more ordered, there's just two floors of studios and then the street between them, which has quite a lot of, I, I think, sort of Gothic atmospherics. <clears throat> With exquisite uh, exquisite craftsmanship of the the um, the paneling and furniture, the best uh, the best crafting I've ever seen of, a, of any job I've been involved in. Actually, in locally in Gold Coast, and then a small building for an institution that was my original place of study before I went to the A. I went to an art school in Bournemouth, which has in recent years become grander. It, it, it became an institute, then a college of universities, and finally in the last 10 years it's been its own university. And I was commissioned as a sort of old boy of the school to come and do an art studio. A studio, a building as a studio, which is very much something that that was done in the Victorian era. And it really uses basic principles. You have a big, big north light and a white room. Towards the back of the room, you have a clear street window that pushes more light onto the back to keep the room light. You hide it so that from the outside, you can't see any of the people inside. From the inside, you can't see any distraction outside except the trees. It points to the trees, which are very much a local these pine trees are very much a local phenomena throughout the town. And from the outside, you can see that little slit that you can see activity inside. People, you can see people's feet, but you can't interfere with them. And it was, it's, it's a steel building. <clears throat> it's built like a ship. In fact, it was built in a shipyard in, in Germany and brought in <clears throat> larger pieces, <coughs> welded together. And the interior, we'll see in a moment, is very, very white. And there's sort of port clochers. You, again, a bit of theater, they hide the entrance. You come upon the entrance. Again, this 
it's, a, it's, it's deliberately keeping distraction out of it, keeping us a pure condition. Now, some people say because it's blue and grass is blue, it's a child of grass. The actual structure is completely differently constructed, although there's one thing that was common to both, which is in the, in the initial drawings, one pitched the curve too flat. It was a different engineer, it's AKT, but in this case, but both times the engineer said, no, no, you've made it to, you've got to, to go with the, you've got to make the curve, the desirable structural curve. So in case of, of both grants, it became more curved in the case of Mont, it became more curved. And the interior is, is um, computer controlled components of, of fiberglass plaster, uh, which inter interestingly still needs two guys on a, on a ladder for about two weeks to, to, to however much it's plotted on the computer. It's still a little bit has to be smooth, but it's, 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 it's a very total building. It, it, it took some time and expense, I suppose, to keep it completely white on the inside and completely blue on the outside. No fiddling around with funny colours of skirting and stuff. It's, 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 it's quite a, you know, I, I suppose the nearest thing I get to being a purist in this building. And it is used, it is extremely heavily used. Uh, the bottom drawing was a drawing done during the process to try and talk about the different, I have a, a captioned version of this drawing where I talk about each of the characters in the cartoon, but I haven't time now to do it. <clears throat> and so I'm interested in, in, in when moving towards the real also about components, even this project, the, 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 the three pyramidal towers for Shenzhen, I make this drawing, which is isolating the various constituent elements. The capsulated part, the gridded part, the skin part, the vegetated part, the perforated part, etc, etc, and make a kind of, not a car, again, it's not a collage, but it could be a collage of, of, of discussing them as components. <clears throat> In this building, and I'm doubting about from place to place and time to time. Uh, it's the largest thing that we've done. It's two buildings actually, again, one in competition uh, for the law, law faculty of the university here, running off on the left. And then there are two sort of cheeks, sort of rounded cheeks that join. And there's a jump to the second building on the right, which is an administration building. I'm very interested in cheerful buildings and this Vienna, which I know well, I think can often be extremely cold and, and gray and grim, even though it's a beautiful city. And the wind howls off the Alps down through Vienna and we give them a colored, jolly, almost seasidey building. And, and the people in it, each time I've been there, have said, oh, we really like the building, it cheers us up. So I'm interested in cheering, cheering people up. And we do have what I euphemistically call sunshine corners. Uh, in a smaller building, which is completed during the pandemic, so this is recent, um, I myself couldn't visit the site for a long period. My younger colleagues would inform me on, on Zoom calls like this and photographs and God knows what. Uh, and then suddenly when I could go back on the site, the thing was three quarters finished. Um, again, it uses the same colors as in Vienna. It's much, it's for the same client as the blue studio. They like the blue studio a lot. They use it in all their publicity. It got a lot of awards. They're very proud of it. So they gave me another building, but the cheap one, this is twice the size of the blue building and half the price. So you get what you pay for and it's really a paint job. Uh, with the purpose of studio, uh, studio space for startup companies. The university has a policy to, to encourage startup design companies and they invite various people to spend a year or two and set up their company within. So I give each company a different window from the other company. <clears throat> and I give them an eyelid that they can 
They can de demonstrate whether they want to be seen or whether they don't want to be seen. So I'm trying to give a little bit of sort of deliberate individuality to those disparate companies that are these little companies are inside. And as I said, it's a cheap building next to workshop building. Uh, it's very bright, even subsequent to this photograph that all the ground is in the same colors as the building. So the ground, it's so red patches and yellow patches and orange patches coming. It's as if it, the, the building spills out. I must make some new photos. <coughs> uh, yeah, here you see it, here it's done by the proper photographer and you can see the colors spilling out onto the ground. And uh, a clock, which for the historians amongst you might be recognizable um, as the clock borrowed from Gunnar Asplund's Gothenburg Law Courts, where, which was a fave of mine when I was a second year student at Bourne. I was really fascinated by us. I had got, somehow got a little book about Asplund and I was just fascinated by that clock. And of course, as a grown up then, was able to visit several times and it was quite amusing showing this slide last night in Gothenburg and then quizzing the audience how many people immediately caught what it was and it was only the I have to say the older members of the audience who got it in one but I sort of quite like that I mean it needed a clock it needed something that knitted the upper floor to the lower floor it needed something that would be an internal focus it probably needed a clock and I thought clock Clock, you know, Gothenburg clock. And we had a very convenient steel column that just was in the right place. Uh, I've been working on some house, house projects. Again, for uh, uh, this is this an N NDA on, 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 on this work, but it is, a, it is a proper proposal done by me studio done by me in the studio not the computer work i have to say but but uh, one of my guys that my elbow and uh, it's a sort of theater project the <clears throat> the nose end of the building has the galleries and the, and the bedrooms and the bathrooms and, and they look down into what is effectively a theater which is effectively a a, a um, an audio visual theater part reality part Induced reality, part virtual reality, and part it's 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 a stage upon which the family can walk, look, walk out and create their own myth of the world. It's just like a sort of like a theatre. And another project which is to do with housing, again NDA on this one, uh, which explores the idea of cutting into the surface. And the final slide, which suggests that ideas do ground, go round and round. The, the project on the left is, is two weeks old. The drawing on the right is about three and a half weeks old. The project on the top right was some years ago, an unsuccessful competition but one which I still love dearly. And the preoccupation in all of them is this business of incising. Um, it's another direction from melting from solid to translucent to transparent. It's actually taking, okay, but you, the basic surface is opaque or appears in the bottom one to be opaque. In fact, it's not. And then you cut into it. It's, it's, it's going the other way and saying, yes, the window is the thing, the cut is the thing. If on one hand, I'm interested in, in bypassing the, what I call the tyranny of the window. In this case, I'm going full face the other way and saying I'm, I'm violating the tyranny of the wall. <clears throat> That's it, guys. Now the, now the questions, I guess.
Thank you so much, Peter. This has been a really such a unique, special treat to have you tour us through 60 years of drawings and uh, recent building projects. Uh, I'll now introduce or reintroduce our MARC students, uh, Vaibhav uh, Vadadoria and Ethan Ross, who will ask you some friendly questions. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Ethan Ross and my partner's name is Vaibhav Vadadoria and we would like to thank you for your interesting and informative presentation. Um, our first question concerns the nickname of the Kunsthaus, the friendly alien, which encapsulates the distinction of the Kunsthaus to the historic Baroque and medieval urban and architectural context of Graz. In retrospect, in which ways do you see the Kunsthaus as friendly to its context, to its visitors and citizens? And more broadly, in your view, what are the responsibilities for architecture and for the architect to adhere to? Well, I think there are buildings that could be considered aggressive. I think they're buildings that where the, the tectonics are so pleased with themselves that they're actually uncomfortable to use. I'm always amused by buildings even that are, that are done by friends of mine and I go to visit them and I, I have difficulty finding the men's room, either because they have deigned to put it in, an, in a difficult position or they've deigned to signpost it. And I'm referred to two one late friend of mine, Zaha Hadid, and a, a fortunately alive friend of mine, Ron Arad, both of whom I think in their own way were design geniuses. But you try and find a toilet in a building that they've done, it's a pain. Uh, and, uh, you know, whereas the old sort of uh, neoclassic guy, you know, the old sort of academy buildings, say, at the turn of the century, you always know to find the toilet, you always what the stair does, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But there's also the thing of, 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 of you can have in, in grants, I think, it's a particularly good city for, as I called it, a sort of patchwork quilt. It's, it's got so many types of architecture. It never has anything that goes for more than about three buildings and then becomes something else. And it does have, have old Baroque onion domes, so that there was curvilinear architecture way, way back. The other thing is that it, it, is, it is strange, but it's very usable. And I, I give a, an anecdotal reference to the fact that the day of opening, I visited it, I had to go to the ceremony, and the no less than the Chancellor of Austria was there, and um, he was chatting and we went together up the travelator, which is a very gentle thing, but a very common thing in railway stations and so on. And we had a glass of agreeable white wine in our hands and we were chatting. And there we are, with, which normally, you know, I am with the Chancellor of Austria, wearing a neat suit, etc., etc. And it would be a very formal thing, but no, we were just chatting, going to the travel and having a bit of a drink. And I like that. I like the nonchalance of it. I think that friendliness is to do with a certain degree of nonchalance. And occasionally, hey, how about this? Um, so, uh, throughout your career, you have been committed to the radicality of architecture. For Archigram, architecture was the site of, for experimentation with the intersection of culture and technology, empowering architecture with capacities to change society. Fast forwarding some years within the technological and disciplinary context of architecture at the millennium, building a double curved envelope or a blob in the parlance of the 1990s and early 2000s was an ambitious goal. In which ways is architecture for you either or both a tool to serve society or want to change it? In which ways does the Kunsthaus install in, built form these notions of how the radicality of technological experimentation in architecture can impact society? No, I think the question is wrong. I think architecture is there to enliven your experience. Um, you know, I think it's to take the, the, the things that we do and we have to do and we'd like to do and to, to take it always that bit further. 
Uh, our, our next question concerns the art or curatorial context of the Kunsthaus. In the past, you have described the Kunsthaus as, quote, black box of hidden tricks, a multidisciplinary venue for new ways to present art of varied media without a permanent connection in, in the art world, the spatial options are most commonly either generic white cubes or black boxes. The Kunsthaus proposed a third space for the interaction of curatorial practices and artists within its architecture. Can you yeah, these questions are very, very convoluted, I have to say. We're a very academic way of asking questions. Never mind. Um, I think that, that what is interesting, I think some artists can't exhibit in there. They find it too, the architecture is too, too present. But a lot of art artists have really enjoyed themselves in there. You know, um, the late Sol Lewitt, to give it one example, and, and um, Olafsson is another example. People have really gone in there and said, hey, right now I'm going to play with this toy. And I think that, you know, you should, I, I mean, I, I know so many interesting art, art museums that then have just white boxes inside. You know, sometimes there's a, there's a, an abdication of the architecture that the architect likes to place as an emblem. And then you just go in a white box. Uh, of course, there's another uh, tradition, which is, you know, the concert hall is very often an, a, a, a box sitting inside quite a different box. You know, there's a whole discussion which one could have about buildings where <clears throat> the inside is one building and the outside is another building. Um, but I think that it, I think straight functionality is one thing and extra to functionality is another thing. But I don't think buildings should be hurtful. I don't think should necessarily be over expensive. I mean, our building, as I say, was 3% over the <clears throat> normal budget. Uh, but most art museums come out at about 15% over the normal budget by the time they've been built. Can I just um, ask a, a technical question to you? What is the scale? Sorry, I've gone on rather later than I expected. And I may have to just stop for a moment and make a phone call because I have a, 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 some meetings coming up here in Copenhagen. Sure, of course. Shortly, yeah. And I don't quite know, I, I've gone on rather a long time with the lecture. So can, can I have a ballpark sort of how, how long are your questions likely to take? Another, Do you know? another five or 10 minutes, is that okay? Okay, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, okay. just give me nervous. That was, I, I won't make the phone call then. I'm, I hope it won't come in now. Okay. Okay. Carry on. So uh, technology has the capacity to enable the production of innovative architecture. The smooth skin of the Kunstas is made of 1200 panels of two centimeter transparent blue uh, pliable acrylic sheets formed on molds. The curved body of the building is punctured by roof nozzles, which point outwards, merging continuously with the surface of the envelope. Initially, the project was proposed with the nozzles responding dynamically and moving kinetically in the direction away from the direct sunlight. So my question is, what were the challenges of building a smooth, nearly seamless architectural scheme? And also, can we ask you what challenges had led to the nozzles being designed as fixed in position rather than kinetic? Um, because we, I think by the time the nozzles, the, the nozzles are some, to some extent iconic. I think that if in, in my own criticism of the nozzles, it would have been wonderful if they could have been uh, movable, but that would, would have cost a lot of money. They are too small. I will admit that this, they, they, they're not doing very much in terms of natural lighting. They're useful as cones for which we then insert particular artificial lighting, but to be really useful, uh, they should be about three times the size. And, and actually the, the Vienna University building 
in the library area where we do have nozzles again. The nozzles have enlarged very, uh, very considerably and actually they do, they are usable in the, <laughs> from the inside, they do light very particular groups of people and work areas so that they are having much more effect. So this is Chris's myself. On the other hand, if you took the nozzles out, you just get a kind of belly of a whale kind of thing. Um, and I, I think the, the nozzle interests me. I have a, a slide, which is not in this lecture, but where I show that I have, well, the, the Bournemouth, the little blue Bournemouth building is if you like a giant nozzle, it's a single nozzle. Uh, now, of course, if you'd had nozzles on the top of grants, the size of that, you'd have probably only had about three or four nozzles, so they wouldn't really be, there'd be outcrops. But I think there's a lot to be done with, with the, com as the nozzles do, combining natural light and artificial light, but making it come from the same zone and therefore have a continuous character. But what were the restrictions? The restrictions, actually, the funny little crew of inventors that we rounded up and, and then people local to grants who were good at inventing cars and planes and bits of, you know, it's an old crafting tradition in that area. There are old, old iron, ironworks where crafting has been going on for sort of three or 400 years. And it's a very good area for, for inventive, they seem to hang out in that part of Austria and around the technical university. So we found lots of sort of technical support, almost of a craft nature. But the other thing is budget. I mean, you could have, like I was saying with the translucent parts in some of the public areas, we would have had much more of that. We'd have had much more ambiguity between the inside and the outside. And we started doing it, as I said, then we got our fingers wrapped. Um, it, it, there are certain things you can do with budget and certainly stepping back between that and the other the little blue building in Bournemouth, the budget was just sufficient for us to be able to have a very pure interior and a very total exterior and to use a very non-local way of building things. Uh, and it, the, the, the university was very generous in allowing us to be to do rather expensive building and you get what you, to some extent you get what you pay for. Um, now somebody's writing something to you. I can see that. We're just uh, shortcutting to yeah. ask the most uh, important questions. Okay. So in these senses of understanding a building as a public interface, Face. Do you see any parallels with the idea that recall the body of radical experimental architecture, which was expressed in so many of the Archigrams project? Yes, I suppose, <clears throat> you know, it, 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 there are buildings that reveal themselves to be quite radical, but sometimes look quite ordinary. I, um, and I'm interested more and more in the vocabulary of architecture and the expression of architecture. Most of what I've been talking about this evening has been about what things look like and, and the statement that they make initially. Although sometimes I've been talking about the inherent kind of um, development of them, either through time or one thing laying upon the other. Uh, I think that the studio, little studio building is not only blue as well as grass, but it did owe something, it instinctively owes something to grass, so it's a much smaller building. It is also to do with art, it's to do with making art, it's to do with bringing light, it's to do with being very direct in a funny way. The inside is of the outside, even if it's a completely contrasting color. The inside is of the outside, even though in, in grants, even though there are several layers 
at the skin, but actually it, it is what it is when you go inside it. Um, that might be a leftover of me being a, trained as a functionalist, that you, you, you do something and that is what it is, whereas uh, later architecture is fascinated by things not being quite what they seem. Um, and I'm interested in, in, at the moment, in sort of hybrids as well, that uh, something looks like stone and it actually turns out to be a, a form of some derivative of plastics or, you know, it, it, it looks, you're not quite sure whether it is timber till you get close to it kind of thing. Also the business of, of the building being an artwork that quite simply making the cheapest building I've ever worked on, which is the, the newest one, we said, okay, well, we can at least afford a paint job. You know, we will, it is an art university. We will make a mural that happens to have these, these individualists sitting inside it. And actually the function of that building, as you see from the interior, is largely as a sort of extended workshop. It's a making building rather than a sort of sitting, talking building, though it has a room in it where people do sit and talk, but it's mostly a place for making. And I enjoy doing buildings where people do things. I think I'm, I, I, I'm not sure that I would, uh, I've never done, well, you could say the admin building of, of Vienna is an office building effectively. It's people sitting at computers and talking to each other, but uh, I, I like, I'm not sure that I, I get off on, on office buildings, quite frankly. Every, every, you know, even one likes to think of the office as a studio uh, and the fact that people are sitting at computers and they sit at computers in offices and I think that's, that's been another message going to, yes? Okay, okay so in 1960s, Archigram had championed among the architectural paradigms, notion of interdeterminacy, interactivity, transformation and change and architecture as infrastructure. Archigram produced 3000 projects, mostly unbuilt in the conventional sense of architectural project. Uh, from your perspective, can you share with the next generation of young emerging architects and current students, how you define an architectural project and how has the notion of architectural project changed since the days of Archigram? I think it's 300, not 3,000, by the way. We would have to be sort of manic to do 3,000. Um, uh, I think that what I would like young architects to do would be to look, to actually look at things. Uh, I, in, in, in my drawings and in the buildings, you know, there's a, there's a subplot here, which I should have int introduced into the lecture, which was some cartoons that I've done, uh, sometimes submitted with the competition entry. Uh, certainly the Vienna building and, and the second Bournemouth building and the first, I've done these drawings about people doing things. And then uh, in the case of the architecture school in Australia, I've had photographs taken of me unwittingly doing some of the things that I was drawing, uh, although I was sending up academic people in the drawings and there I am doing exactly what, what they're doing and somebody snapped me in the building doing it, which I found quite funny. And um, this business of putting together anecdotes, I think architecture is about life. And I think that I feel myself to be contributing or wanting to contribute to the theater of life, helping it on a bit, helping things up to be just a bit more cheerful, just that bit more interesting, just that bit more quirky, that, just that bit more, you know, and, 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 and then seeing, seeing what people do with it. Um, I th but I think looking is very important. I, I, I think that uh, a lot of what I do is a reflection upon something that somewhere I've done or seen or seen somebody doing. You know, if I'm doing a, particularly in buildings for the purpose that I'm very familiar, you know, doing a building for postgraduate students 
It's exactly what I've been dealing with for donkey's years. All my students have tended to be at the later end of the course or are postgraduates. And then I have the, I've had thousands of conversations saying, what do you think I ought to do? Where do you think I ought to go? What office do you think I ought to go to? Do you think I'm really, should I go into journalism? Should I go into sort of boat building? Should I, should I move to Boston? Should I, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, and I've had so many, and these, these run through your head when you're doing, you say, I can imagine a guy like so-and-so, he could sit there. And I have some cartoons about the, the new, the cheap building, where I show the shy girl going into the corner, into the, into the narrow rounded part and sort of hiding. Another sort of noisy guy doing something in another part of the building, etc. Because I know, I, I, have, I know these characters. I'm fascinated by them, you know? And um, we are returning to a real world without it necessarily being Zoom. And it's, it's, it's fascinating, you know, just to see how people, when you're giving a lecture with a, if you guys were sitting in front of me, I could start engaging and maybe sending you up slightly and sort of, and, you know, when you watch people in a, in a like yesterday night, starting to laugh or somebody looking a bit worried or some there was one guy who sat there who had no facial expression at all and i was fascinated i was doing the thing but i was fascinated by this guy I thought, wow, what he's thinking about you know then i happened to have to sit next to him at dinner later and he turned out to be a really interesting guy he just was not the sort of guy that demonstrates much on he gave me a book that he'd written etc well i thought oh this is this guy that i couldn't couldn't figure him out at all. But actually turned out to be, you know, a real warm, interesting guy. Oh, somebody else, you know, is kind of moving all over the place, probably, you know, wasn't really interested at all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, housing is also, I mean, I would like, I would like to do more housing projects, although they're usually unprofitable, but, um, you know, because you, I've, I've lived as a child in many different places and then have, have had to adapt to tall room, narrow room, sharing a room, caravan, da 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 da, da. And then that all goes through your head. And the first competition I won was actually for old people's housing, would you believe? They didn't build it, but I won the competition. It, and it was all anecdotal. <clears throat> I was thinking, how would I live in a restricted space and where would I put my belongings and how would it operate? And I designed it like a caravan. And for some reason, I said, yeah, this is, this is very great use of space. Here's the money. And uh, I can't, I'm not an abstract designer. I can't think, you know, I, 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 I can't, when I write books, I don't have any footnotes. It's chit chat. All my books are chit chat, not theory. <clears throat> I hate theory, actually. I mean, I might have created some theory, but I find that the pursuit of theory has interfered with architectural education to a disastrous effect, particularly in the United States, if I may say. Oops, got that one out. Yeah. So uh, before designing and proposing the Kunstas with Colin Fournier, you had nurtured and developed experimental design practice as a professor and academic leader at the AA, the Standard Show, and the Ballet and elsewhere. So my question is, how did your background working at the forefront of education in architecture and your experience as an experimental educator guide you to propose this radical and experimental building? I think you have to, you know, I, I did explain right at the beginning that drawing that was preceded by nine months of absolute exhaustion and grind. But you have lots of conversations. I think in order to continue as a designer, if you are an academic, and I call myself a joke academic, even if I do carry three professorships or whatever, I, I don't think I'm, I'm a designer who happened to get into academia and they've got out of it. But um, I think you have to switch on. I mean, sometimes I, I have a lot of friends who are, good teachers and, and even have been very good designers and then they get to a point where each time they try and design something they're thinking all the problems all the ways in which you could critique it 
and how they would critique it, how they somebody else might critique it, and then they freeze. I have a sort of switch off. I say, fuck it, you know, we've got this far. Yeah, sure, you know, that bit might not work, but let's go with it. Because I have a cutoff point where I say, let's just go with it, let's go with it, let's go with it. Our, our final question. Um... Is there yeah. avant-garde in That's today's right. architecture? Sorry? Uh, is there avant-garde in today's architecture? Not enough. Mm -hmm. I wish there was. I think most people are very scared at the moment. Everybody wants to be seen to be a good person. You know, they want to do the right thing. They want to be thought of, you know, they want to do, they want to be a good a goody. And everyone's a bit kind. Pisses me off, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a this is a great moment then to to uh, uh, to thank you, Peter. Really, from the, the, the depths sorry, of my I heart. I should have put more Kunsthaus in. Absolutely not. I think I think this was uh, you know you, you selected a. a a visual tour of your uh, drawings, thinking, uh, and narrated that with, uh, it's really quite a special, special event uh, to, to be taken on such a tour. Well, uh, so really, I, can, I only have thanks to, to offer to you. The exhibition is, is due to go next to Oslo, which is a town I seem to remember meeting you in. We did, we had dinner we did, in- We had an exhibition in an the- exhibition in, at-, at in uh, Oslo. Yeah. Ah, the, the main the main museum there, and we went yeah, to dinner. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Well, let's hope let's hope we can do that again. I, on behalf of uh, my dean and our school, uh, I can only thank you really so much for your uh, for the generosity of your time, uh, for such a wonderful tour through sixty years of of your work, uh, and I wish you all the best. Good health and more, more productivity for years to come. Yeah, I, I hope to bump into you in the flesh soon. Anyhow, I hope so too. Here. Yeah, let's go back to that old normal. Thank you guys. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.